Books of Enderal, The Butcher of Ark. Chapter 5. Callion. The man before me towered over me by half a head. His physique was athletic but not heavy, his eyes pitch black and sparkling. Yet it was his smile which caught my eye. It was particular and crooked, and it made me believe that there was nothing that could impress this man. It was neither naive like the smile of a child, nor was it cynical like that of an old man who had seen too much. There he was, and both of us looked absurd. Me, a thin, ugly man, kneeling on the dead body of a giant, my hands soaked in blood, my face apathetic, with my weapon lying next to my feet. He, tall, handsome, wearing elegant clothes, his arms crossed, observing me curiously. Suddenly I broke out into loud laughter. I threw my head into my neck and started to laugh, loud and resounding. The laughter of a man who was overwhelmed by the situation he found himself in, so that his brain left him no other choice. I tried to get up from the body and slipped as my hands did not find any support on the blood-soaked floor. Lengthwise, I fell on the corpse, feeling the warm blood on my body. You have not eaten up, it shot through my head. Bad J.O. Instead of bringing me back to reality, the nonsensical thought fueled my laughter even more. I rolled on my back, clutched my stomach, and gasped for air. The man, whose name was unknown to me then, reacted in a similarly odd manner. First he rubbed his chin with his thumb and index finger and furled his eyebrows. He acted like a farmer whose sheep had started to jump around as if it had been bitten by the black guardian. Then, however, he started to laugh as well. For me and my overwhelmed, confused mind, the situation became more absurd. I gasped for air as the laughter grew so strong that my lungs threatened to fail. Then as hot tears ran down my cheeks, I heard a muffled sound. My sight faded to black, and I lost consciousness. I woke up with a metal taste in my mouth. My eyelids were heavy and glued shut, and my sight was blurred when I opened them. I found myself in a forest, under a small edge at a rock surrounded by dark pine trees. Around the shelter, rain poured down. Only the fire that had burned at arm's length away from me kept me from feeling cold. I tried to turn my gaze so I could fully conceive my surroundings, but a biting pain exploded in the back of my head. I gasped and instinctively pressed my lips and eyelids together. Good evening, I suddenly heard a voice saying nearby. I was scared and tried again to turn my gaze, only to be punished by a more severe pain. This time, a short cry escaped my mouth. The voice next to me reacted with laughter. Then I heard someone stand up and walk over to me. Eventually, I saw a pair of boots, and someone kneeled before me. It was the bow. He wore his chin-long hair and a small top knot, which gave him the look of an Arazalian monk, if it were not for the elegant clothing. I'm sorry about the bump, he said, and smiled apologetically. I must have exaggerated a bit. I looked at the man in confusion. My memories of the day before were pale and remote. The tavern, the humiliation by the two brutes, my plan for revenge, the stable. The insight hit me like a beam of lightning striking down an old tree from a clearing. I had killed him. Massacred him. I pressed my hands on my mouth and felt myself shivering all over. Every detail of last night's events hit me like a hammer. How the brute had caught me in the act and dashed me to the ground. The pain as he kicked me over and over with his boots. The rising of blazing rage. The smacking sound of the dagger as it penetrated his back. His bewildered face. His silent begging for mercy. My frenzy, my satisfaction, my ecstasy that grew stronger with each stab. Without any warning, I vomited on my clothes. I coughed and gagged and I felt tears in my eyes. Slaughtered. You have slaughtered him. It shot through my head again and again. I was so consumed in my thoughts I entirely forgot about the existence of the man in front of me. Finally, I remembered when the moment I lost my consciousness. I stared at him in disbelief. He had not moved a bit and still kneeled in front of me. His mouth smiled, but his eyes were earnest, almost devout. What did it mean? Did he knock me down? He must have done it, and brought me here. But why? As if he had read the question in my eyes, he started to move. He shook his head and pointed at a small bag next to my sleeping place. I looked at him with uncertainty, and his grin widened. What is it? You look at me as if I was Dal Thalgard's ghost. I felt my tension ease up a bit. Still, I was unable to speak a word whereupon the man pursed his lips. Go have a look inside your bag, unless you have a thing for decorating yourself with your own vomit. Only now I hesitantly followed his suggestion and found a large cloth that was embroidered in blue and white. I looked at him again, like a child that received something it never before had held in its hands. He furled his eyebrows skeptically, and I realized that my behavior probably seemed odd to him. 
does it really seem odd? After all, he was the one who had brought me here, and he knows what had happened. Grudgingly, I crossed my legs and started to wipe away the remains of the whisper tree resin that I had consumed yesterday from my robe. The man observed all my movements attentively. He stood up and turned toward the sparkling flames. I noticed that there was something cooking over the fire. Drink. The bile made my mouth feel unpleasantly bitter, and my throat was dry as the dunes from the pinnacle desert. For a moment I felt hunger, but the memories of yesterday's events made it disappear at once. The man ladled something from the kettle, and a faint wind carried a smell of sugar mint and honey to my nose. Then he turned towards me, carrying a bruised cup in each of his hands. He gave me one of them and sat down on a tree stump. It's only bad the first time, I flinched. Pardon me? You surely understand me. For a moment his gaze went astray. Then he shook his head, almost unrecognizably, and turned towards me again. But where are my manners? He knocked his fist against his chest, a military salute that in my eyes seemed inappropriate to his person. I am Kalyan. He looked at me expectantly. When I did not respond, he asked, And who are you? At first I was inclined to tell the man a false name, but I decided against it. J.L. J.L. Tanner's son. The man took off his glove, reached out to me, and I shook his hand. His grip was warm and firm. So, J.L., very pleased to meet you. He smiled and looked straight into my eyes without blinking. I felt an awe of veneration running down my spine. What a presence. I remembered the woman who had sat next to him the other day. Now I understood why she had looked at him with such devotion. Uneasily, I lowered my head. For a moment, I envied Callian's appearance, his demeanor, and his endearing manners. Despite the thousands of questions whirling in my head, I could not help but like the stranger. I was certainly not the first one who made this experience. He radiated a kind of venturesomeness that seemed powerful enough to tempt fate itself. Callian withdrew his hand and took a sip of tea. Well, where do we start? I looked at him helplessly. Start with what? The questions, of course, he smirked. Don't tell me you don't have any. He looked at me appraisingly. Or maybe I should start. Where do you come from, J.L.? You do not look like a man of the world. I come from a small village, I replied carefully. When Callian raised his eyebrows, I added Fogville. Fogville, not a very exciting place. Now I was the one who raised the eyebrows. You know Fogville? Callian made a dismissive gesture with his hand. I once stopped there on a mission. You have a cozy tavern, he smiled, and a few beautiful women. Yes, of course. What in the name of Malthus does this guy want from me? Yesterday he had caught me in the act, he knows, and now we were talking with each other like two hunters who had met in a tavern over a mug of mead. I decided to make a foray, not out of courage or bravery, but because I could not bear the unsaid words any more. I felt a clump forming in my throat and quickly drank a sip of my tea. It was so hot that I asked myself how he had been able to drink it without burning his lips. How did I get here? Callian smiled leniently. I brought you here. He seemed to notice the irritated look on my face and added, After I'd struck you down. Let's say you had problems coping with a the situation. There was a moment of silence. I took care of the bodies. The word hit me like a hammer. Again I felt bile rising up in my gullet. This time, however, I was able to suppress the urge to vomit. As a result, I had a terrible taste on my tongue. I coughed and stared at the man with uncertain eyes. He talks as if all of this was perfectly normal. But it was not, damn it! I had committed a crime. Even worse than the crime itself was the manner in which I had committed it. I am a monster. A god-forsaken monster. As if he had read my mind, he bent forward a bit. I know what you're thinking, J.L., you feel guilty, don't you? You feel like a monster or something like it? I looked at him in unease. Then I turned my gaze away, which he seemed to interpret as approval. Forget about that nonsense. What you did was the right thing. A sad laughter escaped my throat. <laughs> the right thing? Yes, but wait. He rubbed his chin with his thumb and his index finger and looked into the fire. Let me tell you a story, then you will understand. I nodded, and he started to narrate. There was once a family, five people, a woman and her two husbands and two children. He seemed to notice that I wrinkled my forehead. And they came from Kira, for in Kira they live differently, you know. There are not only couples, but also people living in larger families called circles. Anyway, 
He shortly paused and drank some tea. This family was not a lucky one. One of the husbands, called Keshin, had just lost his job on a sugar plantation outside of El Rashim, the capital. The wife, who had worked as a weaver with a wealthy merchant, also lost her job when the merchant experienced financial troubles. All in all, the situation in El Rashim was troublesome. The streets were dangerous, the meat maggot plague was raging, and it was no good time for people who lived in a circle with two children and had no pinyols in their pocket. So they decided to find happiness elsewhere. His eyes went astray, towards a new world, a new life, and so he turned towards me again. They spent their very last money for a journey to Enderal. However, when they arrived in Ark, they realized that life here was not at all as they had imagined. And none of them, except for one of the husbands, spoke Enol. Therefore, they moved to the Undercity. For a moment, I thought I saw melancholy in his amber eyes. Do you know the Undercity, J.L.? I, yes, I have heard of it. He nodded. Well, so you know that it is not a friendly place for families. The streets are dangerous. Blackmail and murder are the order of the day. It is a slum, and the most ironic thing about it is the fact that the cavern in which it is erected lies directly underneath the upper city of Ark, where noblemen have masquerade balls and philosophize about morals and ethics. With the last part of the sentence, rage flashed through Kalian's eyes. It stayed there for a moment and disappeared as fast as it had arrived. Anyway, the small family moved into one of the shabby box-shaped homes in an alley called Canal Street. The street lived up to its name, stinking, dark, and narrow. Even though it was definitely not the new beginning the circle had envisioned, the three parents did not become discouraged. They knew about the obstacles and were determined to overcome them. Aside from that, their faith in Irlanda strengthened them. In their tiny house, which consisted of only one room divided by cloth, they had erected a shrine. Every evening they prayed to their goddess, and they drew courage and strength from it. Indeed, things seemed to get better when Keshin was hired on a farm outside the walls of the city. Now you might not understand how particular this was, but let me tell you that it is more likely that a Vatir learns to read and write than that someone from the Undercity, and to make matters worse, someone with dark skin, finds decent and honest work with a farmer in the heartland. Keshin was aware of this, for he and his circle had learned that there were people who hated them just because of their origin alone, and these were not merely just people from the Upper City. Even their neighbors shouted shagarounds or charcoal people at them on the streets. For the world is like this, my friend. People are afraid of what they do not know. Families with multiple parents, Eterna, people with black skin, all foreign things are dangerous to them. Yet Keshin fought even harder. Every morning he got up, long before the first cock crow, and walked the arduous way to the farm where he worked. He returned long after the sun had set, Work was hard, but he was grateful for the opportunity to give his family, especially his two children, a better life. Callian stopped, picked up a piece of firewood, and threw it into the fire. Then he continued. But things turned out differently, of course. For among all the noble people who lived in Ark, there is, well, a faction. It calls itself the Citadel, and understands itself as a bastion of traditional values, as they put it. At some point, they got wind of the charcoal man who took away a hard-working, honest Andralian's job on a farm. The Citadel's members knew what they had to do. One night, when Keshin returned to his little house in Canal Street, he sensed that something was wrong. He was unable to put his finger on it. He just felt like a mother who had felt something had befallen her son. He found out what happened after he had entered his home. All of his family were dead. Both his children, Lilea and Geral, his husband, Geshek, and his wife, Zamira. His children he found in a corner, crouched together and wrapped in a bloody cloth. They had cut Lilea's throat and Garal's thigh artery. Geshek seemed to have fought back, and he had been stabbed several times in his chest before he was beheaded. Zamira lay flat on the table, and the blood between her legs was clear evidence of what they had done to her before she was killed. Just as Keshin wanted to cry out, he felt a burning pain in his back, and he fell to the ground, dead. Callian had narrated the last part of his story without blinking his eyes. Stunned and speechless, I looked at him. Again, he returned my look without blinking. Tell me, J.L., what do you think of my story? Do you like it? Is it true? I asked for want of a better reply. Yes, it's true. I looked at Callian, seeking advice. What in blazes does he expect from me? That's terrible. Callian nodded. Exactly. 
And what would you say if I told you that the two men yesterday that we have killed were members of the Citadel? I was petrified. Pardon me? The two apes who now lie dead at the bottom of the pond. I did not notice at that time that he used exactly the same word for them as I did in my thoughts. They were members of the Citadel, and they had murdered the family of the Kiranian. All for the greater good, of course. Again, there was cold rage in his eyes. I do not understand, I replied, even though I did. Callian narrowed his eyes to a slit. Oh, yes, you do. Salbor and Adreyu Mithal. They are sons of a wealthy ruler from Endral's north, and they are murderers. For a short, irrational moment, I was flooded with triumph. They have deserved to die. The corners of my mouth twitched, but then the images flashed before my eyes and the terrible memories returned. Memories of the joy that I had felt when I had stabbed the man, massacred him, the blood. But I was not aware of it, even if... I stopped mid-sentence and lowered my gaze. How only could I in any way describe the way I felt? For a moment there was a silence between us. Just when I wanted to ask a question, Callian did something unexpected. Before I knew what happened to me, he was right before me, leaving only two hands' width between our faces. I would have flinched, but something in Callian's gaze paralyzed me. I was unable to move, stiff as a wax figure. For an instant I was unable to notice the change in him, but then I realized it. His eyes were blazing. First I thought that it was a reflection of the campfire. But when I saw that the fire burned behind Callion, I knew that his eyes indeed had changed color. They seemed like glowing coal, like a candlewick just before it was completely consumed by fire. His features had lost the joviality that was present in the past thirty minutes. Then he began to speak, quietly, but sound and clear. The tone of his voice sent shivers down my spine. The scum deserved to die, J.L. They were corrupted. He made no move to explain the last word. I was in the Red Ox because I was chosen to murder them. You had beaten me to it, and you have done me and the world a favor. I did not know where I took the strength from to answer, but I did, even though my words were only a whisper, like a deathbed confession. But I savored it. Disgust arose in me once again. A dull fear, the burden of a man who knew that he had done something terrible. My shoulders slumped and I lowered my head as if it was Malthus and not Callian to whom I just confessed the ecstasy during the murder. But Callian did not allow me to get overwhelmed. He put his right hand on my shoulder and with his left hand turned my face so that I looked directly at him. Then he spoke, slowly and clearly. I know, J.L. Do you know why? He did not give me any time to reply. For you have felt what they had done. You have felt their crimes and their guilt and the ecstasy was the reward for your courage. He paused. It was the nectar of their sins. Then, with a short, fleeting moment, it was over. The glow in Callian's eyes was gone. He sat back, and a look at his face made me wonder if my mind had played a trick on me. He remained silent. After minutes of silence, I asked the crucial question, without even knowing what I really wanted to ask. Why? But Callian understood. Because you are special and because the blood that runs in your veins is the same as mine, and that of our brothers and sisters. I stared at him in a baffled way. My mental capacity was exhausted. Brothers and sisters? I could not go any longer. My eyelids were leaden, my limbs were faint and weak. Callian seemed to notice. There is a long journey ahead of us. I will explain everything that you need to know, but now go to sleep. The glimmer that I had seen in his eyes before returned for a moment. Dusk is nearing. You might ask yourselves why I follow this strange man, and I cannot give you a clear answer to that question. Surely many things would have turned out differently if I had slipped off in the gray mist of the morning. But my exhaustion did not allow me to leave. Another reason for me to stay was perhaps that all things that had happened to me in the week before seemed bizarrely familiar to me. I probably would not have left anyway, since Callian's words had a hypnotic effect on me, which I was unable to explain to myself. It was the nectar of their sins. A thousand questions were haunting my mind. Nevertheless, the knowledge that the murder that I had committed was a good and righteous deed plagued my mind. It was a particular feeling to have killed a man. Young soldiers and guardsmen have colorful dreams about honor and glory. When they think about thrusting a sword into an unrighteous man's chest, they believe it to be a sublime feeling. Even though the experience had been sublime for me, the aftermath was not. 
My state shifted between an emotionless paralysis and lightning-fast epiphanies filling me with guilt and disgust, which overcame me like an autumnal flood at the coast of Maiar. At these moments, one wonders if killing can be justified at all. The more often you perform the act of killing, though, the less doubts you have. The coldness grows until the taking of life becomes trivial. Back then, however, this way of thinking was unfamiliar to me. When in the light of the setting sun, Callian offered me a bowl of hot, steaming oatmeal and blood-red wild berries. I was overcome with nausea even before I ate a spoonful of it. Did I notice a hint of guilty conscience in Callian's eyes? Or was it amusement? I did not know. While we packed our belongings, I asked him about the meaning of yesterday's testimony once again. He only shook his head and told me the meaning of the fire could not be learned by conversation alone, such as swimming could not be learned by reading books about the consistency of water. And so both of us, as different as day and night, headed towards the legendary capital. He was well-dressed, handsome, and always confidently smiling. I was dressed in worn-out clothes, had a hooked nose, and a puzzled look of a man who had no idea what was happening to him. The first two days of our journey were terrible. I barely ate, and most of the time I thought I could see blood on my hands or hear human death cries among the singing of birds. Even the silence did not calm me down. Please, no. But on the third day, things started to get better. And for the first time since I met Callian, I did not feel the weakening nausea every time I halted and allowed my thoughts to wander. Of course, my state of mind was far from joyful, but in an odd way, I felt better than after my departure from Fogville. There was a simple reason for this. The fear was gone from my stomach. Or in better words, I felt as if I had appeased it, like a wild animal that just had a good meal, knowing that there was more to come. I am on the right path. How strange these words sounded in my mind, but yet I felt all right, as if I had glimpsed a light on the horizon, a light I should have been following all my life. My sense of guilt began to diminish as well. Even though there was no way for me to verify Kalyan's story, I knew that it was right. Their arrogant faces, the vile voices, these two men had been evil, corrupted. And there would have been more victims after Kishin's family. The more time I spent thinking about such things, the more truthful they rang in my mind. While we were wandering, Callian told me a lot of other things. Great deals of it were stories from his past. I now knew he came from Nerim, a fact that explained his subtle accent. He grew up in Kibet, the capital of Northrom. Just as the Middle Realm, it was under the rule of Chancellor Baratheon. But Callian assumed that a civil war between northern separatists and the Chancellor was imminent within the next ten years. His migration to Enderal had many reasons, and with a look that was rejecting, yet not harsh, he indicated that I was not ready to know these chapters of his past. After a week's march, we arrived in Ark. I do not wish to spoil ink with descriptions. I am sure that the capital of Enderal is well known to you. And you might imagine how overwhelmed I was by its sight. We first saw it from a small mountain ledge, and I spent minutes watching the city, bathing in the light of the setting sun. Impressive, isn't it? I heard a voice next to me. It was Callian. I murmured something without turning my gaze. He gave off a laugh. Indulge! Sometimes the first time is the best time. He said and sat down at the edge of a cliff, a chasm of about four hundred arms length deep. I looked at him and saw that he had closed his eyes and let the evening sun shine on his face. Again I felt envy rising. If a young woman had come up the hill, she could have considered him the hero of a bard's song. But at the same time, I knew that Callian did not show off. He simply enjoyed the view, the moment, and the sunlight, an ability I had not developed in my life. It was already dark when we showed our papers to the city guards and asked for entrance. We pretended to be merchants from Araziel who had to stay in the harbor of Duneville due to unfavorable weather. After checking the papers quickly, the guardswoman allowed us to pass. When the heavy gates shut behind us, the portcullis came down with a loud noise. Any remaining thoughts about my return to my old life as a priest vanished. We made a stop at a tavern called the Dancing Nomad. Callian opened his bulging purse and invited me to a stew of sugar beets, dark bread, and a very expensive beer from Kibet. This time we did not talk much. Instead, we listened to the music of a beautiful red-haired bard whose dark voice was in stark contrast to her fragile physique. She sang traditional tunes such as Song of the Aged Man, The Pathless Wanderer, or The Maid in the Silver Glow. I looked down in unease as Callian started to sing along to the last song in full voice. 
Only when I noticed that people did not object to his good but not brilliant singing, but started to join in, my ungrounded shame faded away and I felt increasingly comfortable. We stayed in the tap room until late. When only five other guests were with us, I asked the question that had been burning on my lips. What now? I spoke quietly, dazed by alcohol and the loudness of the past hours. Callian's gaze met mine, and he did not lower it until I directed mine towards the ground in unease. I heard Callian emitting a sound that could have been muffled laughter as well as a sigh. Now we're going to sleep like dogs, and tomorrow, his eyes sparkled for a moment, the first lesson awaits you. I had no idea what his words meant. The first lesson? He smiled.